Hello everyone and welcome. In this video we're going to be talking about the new Tesla Roadster and how the cold gas thrusters which are going to be on this Roadster, essentially rockets, how these rockets work. And by analyzing these rockets and figuring out how they work, we can determine the performance characteristics of the Tesla Roadster. So acceleration, braking distances, cornering, that sort of thing. And what I think is really cool about this video is that the conclusions from it will be drawn not based on my own assumptions, but based on what has been publicly stated about the Tesla Roadster. So the first thing I want to figure out is how much does the Tesla Roadster weigh? And I have an idea of what I think it's going to weigh, but can we figure out how much it's going to weigh based on the limited figures that Tesla has provided? So they've told us that the Roadster will have a 0 to 60 of 1.9 seconds. This will be the base version. And that it will have 10,000 Newton meters of wheel torque. So we're trying to figure out the Tesla's mass. So Newton Newton tells us that force is equal to mass times acceleration. We can figure out what our force is, we can figure out what our acceleration is, and then that will allow us to learn what our mass is. So the acceleration figure is that 0 to 60 in 1.9 seconds. So first we're going to find out acceleration, then we're going to find out the force, and then we can plug all that in to figure out mass. So starting off with velocity equals acceleration times time. In this case we're accelerating to 60 miles per hour in 1.9 seconds. 60 miles per hour is about 26.8 meters per second, so we're going to set 26.8 meters per second, that's our velocity, equal to our acceleration times time. It only takes us 1.9 seconds to get there, and that gives us 14.1 meters per second squared as our acceleration. Writing that in forms of g's, you simply take that 14.1, divide by 9.8, and you get 1.1. 4, 4 G's. Okay, so we know what our acceleration is, so now we just need to figure out what our wheel force is. And we're given our wheel torque. So torque is equal to a force multiplied by a radius. So since we know what our torque is, and if we can figure out what the wheel's radius is, then we can figure out what the wheel force is. Now on the prototype Tesla Roadsters, you can see on the front wheel there is a 265 over 35 R20 tire, and on the rear wheel is a 325 over 30 R21 tire. You can do the math to calculate what is the radius of one of these tires, and if you take the average of both of them, you get a diameter average of about 710 millimeters, or about 28 inches. This gives you a radius, just divide that number by two, of 355 millimeters. So we can take our wheel torque number and then divide that by our radius, 0.355 meters, and that gives us a wheel force of 28,170 newtons. So now we can get an estimate for how much this car is going to weigh. So 28,170 newtons, set that equal to mass multiplied by our acceleration, 14.1 meters per second squared, and that gives us a mass of 1,998 kilograms, which is conveniently close to 2,000 kilograms. So that would be my estimate for what I think the target weight for this vehicle is going to be. Now, do I think it's actually going to weigh just 2,000 kilograms? I do not, and reason being is that the Model S, which has a 100 kilowatt hour battery pack, the performance version is good for about 350 miles, this is claiming that it's going to be good for 620 miles, significantly longer range, and that Model S with the 100 kilowatt hour battery pack uh, it weighs in at 2,240 kilograms or close to 5,000 pounds. So this is 4,400 pounds, uh, you know, 500 pounds lighter than that Model S with significantly more range. So what in reality I think is going to happen is this car is going to be heavier than 2,000 kilograms and it's actually going to have a higher wheel torque than 10,000 newton meters. In fact, the Model S has about 11,000 newton meters of wheel torque, uh, which I calculated in a previous video. So I would assume this number will be larger and this number will be larger as well. But this is what we're going to use because this is what Tesla has stated. So for this video, we are going to assume a mass of 2,000 kilograms. All right, so let's move on to the optional package on the Tesla Roadster, the SpaceX thruster package. So instead of the two rear seats, you take out those two rear seats and in its place, you put a composite overwrapped pressure vessel. Essentially, this is just a tank where you hold really high pressure compressed air. How high pressure? Well, on Joe Rogan's podcast, Elon has stated around 10,000 PSI. And then around the vehicle, you're going to have these cold gas thrusters. 
So how this works is you have a battery, that battery powers a pump, that pump pressurizes this COPV, your composite overwrap pressure vessel, and that composite overwrap pressure vessel then can send pressure to thrusters around the vehicle. And they've tweeted that there will be about 10 of these cold gas thrusters around the vehicle, uh, some of which may be hiding behind a license plate, so you can pop the license plate out of the way and then have these thrusters appear and then accelerate really quickly. Um, so pretty neat system, and it is all run off of the battery. So the battery runs pump, the pump keeps the pressure in the tank, and then of course your discharge will likely be much faster than this pump can keep up with. So in times when you're driving that you don't need uh, to use those thrusters at full acceleration, the battery will be running this pump and repressurizing this tank. So the question is, how much thrust, how much force do these cold gas thrusters push the Tesla Roadster with. And so I am not a rocket scientist, uh, so those of you that are rocket scientists will likely be disappointed by the depth of this explanation. However, there is an equation out there which we can use to determine the thrust of a rocket. The force of thrust is equal to gravity multiplied by specific impulse multiplied by our mass flow rate. That's your propellant that's coming out of the rocket. Now, where does this equation come from? There is a derivation. I will include a link in the video description if you are curious about that. Um, but if you look at the units here, gravity is in units of meters per second squared, specific impulse is in units of seconds, and mass flow rate is in units of kilograms per second. So if you multiply all that out, you get kilogram meters per second squared, in other words, newtons. Now, if we look at Newton's uh, law here, force equals mass times acceleration, mass is units of kilogram, acceleration meters per second squared, kilogram time meter per second squared in newtons. So you can see the correlation between these two equations here. So the big takeaway with all of this is that you're going to have some stuff inside the rocket, inside this pressure tank, and you're going to throw that stuff outside the rocket. You're going to throw it away from the vehicle. And in throwing that stuff away from the vehicle, you have that equal and opposite reaction where you send your vehicle in the opposite direction. So that's all we're doing. We're taking a compressed air within this uh, pressure tank and we're throwing it out outside and that's going to push our vehicle forward. Now again, we're trying to figure out how much thrust will these rockets actually create. So we have four variables here, and if we figure out any three of them, then we can determine the last one. Unfortunately, all we know is gravity. Gravity 9.81 meters per second squared. We do not know specific impulse, we don't know our mass flow rate, we don't know the force of thrust. So that's the bad news. Well, what can we figure out? Well, specific impulse is how effectively a rocket uses a propellant. It's defined as the change in momentum per unit fuel used. So it is given in units of time, which doesn't really make sense unless you go through the derivation, uh, but it is given in units of seconds. So the thing to know about a specific impulse is that it's dependent on the design of your rocket and dependent on the propellant used. So something like a cold gas thruster, where you're not relying on the chemical energy of combustion, combusting a fuel, is going to have a lower specific impulse than a rocket that is using a combustible fuel. So for example, the space shuttle, its specific impulse of its rockets used uh, 350 seconds versus the cold gas thrusters tend to have a peak of around 70 seconds. I found a study saying that nitrogen, which is the majority of what compressed air is, can have a specific impulse of 73 seconds. So for this video, we're gonna use around 70 seconds as our specific impulse for our cold gas thruster. That is one thing that we do not know that Tesla has not provided that we are going to have to make some form of an informed assumption about. Now here's where I got stuck. So we know what gravity is. I have a decent idea of what the specific impulse might be, but I have no way of knowing what the mass flow rate is going to be. And so without knowing that, there's no way that I can determine what our thrust force is. And then I realized I don't have to figure that out. Uh, as I saw a tweet uh, that Elon had posted saying that the Tesla Roadster will do something like this in reference to a car that was floating. So a car was floating and presumably it has to be doing so using downward thrust. And so the force of that thrust at a very minimum 
in order for it to hover must be equal to the vehicle's weight. So mass times gravity. So we know what our vehicle's mass is. We calculated that earlier, 2,000 kilograms. And we can multiply that by gravity, essentially 10 meters per second squared. And so that gives us a force of thrust minimum of 20,000 newtons. Now, this doesn't include the weight of the driver. It doesn't include any cargo capacity, anything like that. And it wouldn't actually allow you to accelerate up and actually move above the ground. It would just allow you to float there. Basically, the car would become weightless. So it has to be slightly higher than 20,000 newtons. So let's just say 21 kilonewtons or or in other words, it can accelerate upwards with 1.05 g. However, you have a downward force of 1 g, so you would be accelerating upwards at just 0.05 g. A small amount, but enough to just be able to lift you off the ground and then come back down. Okay, so here comes the really exciting part because today's cars are limited in how quickly they can accelerate based on the tires that they have. It's all based on grip. If they don't have enough grip, it doesn't matter how much power you put into them, they won't be able to accelerate any faster because they are limited by those tires. Rockets, on the other hand, have no such limitation. If you have a greater force coming out of the back, you accelerate forward quicker. It's as simple as that. And so you get to add the acceleration of a rocket to the grip of the tires. And so if we go back to our original equation, velocity equals acceleration times time, we can try and calculate what will our theoretical zero to 60 mile per hour or 100 kilometers per hour be. And so we know that our tires are capable of accelerating at about 1.44 Gs. And we know that our rocket is capable of providing a downforce of 1.05 Gs. Now we're going to assume that we can point that thrust in the rearward direction. And they're saying that they're gonna have these rockets on the back of the car for accelerating. So we'll assume that they're back there and they can take advantage of that full 1.05 Gs of acceleration. So we're adding this 1.45, 1.05, we add that together and we get 2.5 Gs of acceleration. And so we can plug that into our velocity equals acceleration times time equation, 26.8 meters per second times 2.5 Gs times 9.8 one times time and time is 1.1 seconds. Zero to 60 in 1.1 seconds, which is about twice as good uh, half the time as the next best thing that exists today as far as street cars are concerned. So this is extremely impressive. Now it is important to state the disclaimers that go along with this. So this is assuming that the vehicle will be able to hover. It's assuming it's going to be able to use that amount of thrust in the rearward direction to push the vehicle forward. And it's also assuming that it will have enough thrust to last that full zero to 60 launch. I anticipate it will have enough to do it because I anticipate that this is gonna be a little party trick for how to have the fastest zero to 60 out there uh, of a street car. And so they'll wanna make sure that it will last the full duration. Um, so I would assume, you know, something around the 1.1 second time frame is realistic. If you start to increase this number, you know, think if this thing's actually going to accelerate upward, especially if it were to have several passengers in the car, it's going to we need to be significantly higher than 20,000 newtons. So if this were to just raise to 25,000 newtons, 21 or 25 kilonewtons there, that would give you 1.25 Gs. And in that scenario, you would have a dead on one second, zero to 60. And for the car magazines out there that ignore that first foot of acceleration, they'll all be saying it does zero to 60 in under a second, which it wouldn't be, but potentially it could be depending on how high that force will be. So very cool uh, that the, the limit of you know cars is being overcome simply by using rockets. Will be something that you can actually use on the street, doubtful, uh, but on a track it will certainly feel quite cool or on a drag strip, something like that. Now there are other cool things you can calculate. So how about braking from 60 miles per hour down to zero? And what distance can it accomplish this? Now the best I found out there was the Porsche GT2 RS, which Motor Trend tested of having a 60 mile per hour down to zero stopping distance of just 87 feet or about 27 meters. This Roadster, if it was able to apply that full thrust in the forward direction while slamming on the brakes, would be capable of stopping from 60 miles per hour down to zero in about half of that, 45 to 50-ish feet, or about 14 meters. Absolutely insane, uh, the kind of stopping power that this might have, assuming it has those thrusters up front. 
Now, finally, I want to talk about weight. So how much compressed air do you actually need to store on board in order for this to actually be achievable? And so we're going to go back to this equation here. I want to make sure it doesn't go to waste because it actually is fairly useful. So we can rearrange it to calculate our mass flow rate. And we're going to calculate it based on our calculated force right here of 21 kilonewtons. So 21 kilonewtons multiplied by gravity, multiplied by our specific impulse, and that gives us a mass flow rate of 30 kilograms per second. So for every second you want to be able to use this device, you need 30 kilograms or about 66 pounds of air stored on board, which is significant, but not really unrealistic. It's why I say though that I don't think it's going to last much longer than maybe one or two seconds, because think about how much weight that is. If you wanted to store five seconds worth of this boost, then you're talking about like 300 pounds that are going to be stored on board. Uh, it's going to take up a lot of space and it's going to be very heavy. So there's reasons why you might not want to do that. Um, and so I would, I would anticipate somewhere in the one to two second range so that they can get that party trick of an insanely quick zero to 60. Um, and as far as cornering is concerned, yes, you could theoretically have 2G cornering. But remember, if you're mid corner and then this thing stops because you only have so much of it, well, then you lose all that grip and you start sliding. So you could go at a lower flow rate and say maybe corner at like 1.1 G's for 10 seconds rather than 2 G's for one second. But again, it's not going to be, in my opinion, super useful for cornering unless they really have a significant amount of storage on board as far as how much air they can hold because you would never want the system to run out of air as you're going around that corner. So it would likely have to have some sort of feed off, you know, algorithm in there where it says, okay, we're running low on pressurized air. Let's start to decrease how much we're assisting. And then you start to understeer and slide off the track. So I don't think in cornering you have enough mass, enough flow for a long enough duration to make it make sense but certainly for accelerating, certainly for uh, stopping, and then a fun little floating party trick maybe uh, for like one or two seconds, um, it, it may be possible. Either way, very cool stuff and very cool how rockets can allow you to skip over you know, the boundaries set by street tires. So you can get zero to 60s faster than about two seconds, uh, which is where current street tires are really limited at as far as zero to 60 times. Thank you all so much for watching. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below.